looking at big questions that people have about um, the Bible, about God, about Christianity. Um, And today's question about the God of the Old Testament is a really huge question uh, that we come to. Um, Is the God of the Old Testament a moral monster? I don't know whether you saw um, a couple of years ago now this series that came on TV, The Bible. Um, It was uh, on for a number of weeks, and it went through the whole Bible from the Old Testament uh, through to the New, portraying very graphically uh, a number of the events, of course not all of them, but a number of the the key events in the, the Old Testament especially. And I don't know whether if you watched that, how you felt as you watched it, but for a lot of people, one of the reactions was, gosh, is this what is really in the Bible? Um, Because actually when you start to look at what the Bible describes, what the events that we find in the Old Testament particularly, you can find all sorts of moral problems with that. What kind of God authorizes war and violence and what seems to be genocide? I don't know whether you've read Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, Uh, but at the beginning of that book, um, Richard Dawkins has this now kind of infamous quote. Uh, He's often asked to read this quote um, in different settings, but he says this about the God of the Old Testament in particular. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Well, I think he gets more adjectives into a sentence than anyone else in history, but you get the point. He's saying, what kind of God do we find in the Old Testament? And it's also worth noticing that the objection that we come to today is not particularly an intellectual objection about God's existence, but it's a moral objection about God's character. And it's worth noting that the kind of questions that we have do fit into those two categories. Often our problem is not just that we might have questions about whether Christianity is true, but also whether it's good. And actually often it's our moral objections that underlie our intellectual rejection of Christianity sometimes. We just don't think that God is ultimately very good. Um, Can I say, by the way, that as a Christian, I also find the Old Testament quite difficult. Um, I don't read stories in the Old Testament and think, oh, that's nice. Um, There are some bits of the Old Testament I read and I think, oh, personally, if I was writing it, I kind of wish that bit wasn't there. Can I also say, though, that the reason why I find reading the Old Testament difficult is not because of the influence of atheistic humanism in our society today, but actually because I'm a Christian, because of Jesus Christ. See, as a Christian who believes in the one who said, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, who believes in someone who said, turn the other cheek, who forgave people who crucified him, who told them to put away the sword, who said that his kingdom was not of this world. It's because of Jesus that I find so much of the Old Testament really difficult. And actually, I would suggest that the reason why a lot of us find the Old Testament really difficult is because our culture and our thinking has been shaped very much by the Christian worldview of our heritage. In fact, might want to be provocative and say, what is it about the atheistic worldview that says this is utterly inconsistent? What is it about the atheist worldview that says that this kind of killing should never and can never happen? Um, I mentioned at the beginning that my surname originates from Estonia. Um, My great-grandparents were killed in the Soviet regime uh, during the Second World War, Um, a regime inspired by a lot of atheistic thinking. But this is a problem because we can't just split the Bible up. I know the Bible is split up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't split the Bible up and talk about two gods because Jesus in the New Testament speaks about the Old Testament and claims to be revealing the same God that we read about in the Old Testament. He's not saying now God has suddenly changed or he's schizophrenic. The God of the New Testament, the God of Jesus, is the same God. So how do we respond to it? I guess one of the problems in coming to a subject like this is we can like want a soundbite answer. We want want something that will be kind of quick and easy to remember. And I have to say, I have no soundbite answer on the question of the Old Testament. Um, So if you're wanting kind of one sentence, you're going to have to have a few more. 
um, which also requires patience on our part because we need to actually bear in mind the bigger picture of what's going on rather than just trying to find an immediate response that will satisfy us. Can't promise to do that. A couple of things also worth saying by way of introduction, and that's this. Firstly, just because the Old Testament describes stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that it prescribes it. Now, what do I mean by that? One of the mistakes sometimes that people like Richard Dawkins makes is that he, dis- uh, he looks at some of the things that the Old Testament describes, some of the stories, and he says, this is horrific. But actually, he's recording or describing events that the Bible doesn't say are good. In fact, sometimes the Bible quite clearly says are bad. The Bible doesn't you know, describe a different world. It describes this world full of you know, often war and brutality. Um, if you look in the book of Judges in the Bible, there's a lot of descriptions of stuff that are really horrific. But at the end of the book, it says this. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. In other words, this is not a description of people doing what God has told them to do. This is a description of people doing exactly what God hasn't told them to do. Just because it's described doesn't mean it's prescribed. And secondly, just because God permits something doesn't mean it was his original pattern. Verse in the New Testament that's quite helpful, Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, um, not about war but actually about divorce, is interesting in this. Jesus said um, once, he said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. In other words, Jesus is saying God's pattern for this world was not a world of divorce and broken relationships, but because we live in a world that is broken, and we'll think a lot more about that on Thursday, God's actions in this world are actions that take into account the fact this world is already broken and gone wrong. And you could also say, possibly, that that could be the case when we look at some of the violence and the war in the Old Testament too. God's pattern for this world was never for war and violence. And his hope for this world is also a world one day will be without war and violence. But actually, we live in a world that's broken. Now, having said that, of course, we still may have lots of objections. Because, of course, there are clearly bits of the Old Testament where God clearly is not just describing but prescribing things. For instance, particularly we might be thinking about the story of the Exodus where God takes the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan and they drive out forcibly and in the process of doing so kill many people as they conquer this this new land that God has given them. Uh, We can't simply say that God didn't want that to happen quite clearly it was the intention of God. So how do we come across these passages? How do we make sense of them? Again, again, bear in mind, there are no soundbite answers. And also bear in mind, these things are not easy. But here's the first thing to bear in mind. That what's going on here is not genocide, but judgments. I think one of our problems is we think that you know, these people who lived in places like Canaan were just kind of nice people like the people of Wales, kind of minding their own business, tending their own sheep. Sorry if you're from Wales. But um, you know, they're just generally quite lovely people. And God says to these people, okay, go in and invade that country and kill lots of people. But actually, in the Bible itself, we read what the practices were of some of these nations. Back in the book of Genesis, we read this. Uh, sorry, Deuteronomy, not Genesis. God says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn or to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or catch, um, casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out the nations before you. You see what I'm saying? It's saying actually one of the reasons that this um, nation were called to exact God's judgments was that these very practices were going on, including child sacrifice. Now you might say, well, that's just in the Bible. Maybe that's just giving some kind of excuse for what they did. But actually it's not just in the Bible. Just go to the British Museum in London, and you'll see plenty of evidence of these kind of things, including child sacrifice that happened in these nations. And so what God is doing is not just saying, I like one nation, I don't like this nation, and this nation can kill this nation, but he's saying, no, there are some things that have become so evil that actually judgments must happen. It was appalling. And by the way, just at this point, it's worth saying this. When we look around our world today, we also see appalling evil, don't we? Uh, Most currently in the hands of people like ISIS, 
And isn't our reaction when we see stuff like the evils and the horrors that are perpetrated by ISIS, the reaction that we say, surely God should intervene? Why doesn't God do something? I ask that. But if we ask God, why don't you bring justice in the face of such evil, we can't also at the same time blame God for when he once did. See, it's not genocide that's going on here, I'd say, but judgments. But there's also a second thing that's worth bearing in mind, and that's, I put it this way, that what's happening here is not normative, but unique. Um, What we see happening, particularly in the story of the Exodus, is part of a bigger story of what God is doing through the storyline of the Bible. And that is that at the same time as exacting judgments upon very evil practices that have grown up in that land, he's also setting up a nation that are like, they're meant to be a model of what God's people are meant to be like. Not a nation that God is going to kind of choose as his favorite so that he can then just reject the rest of the world, but ultimately a nation that will show to the rest of the world what it can truly be like to live in God's kingdom, to live in God's way. And at times, only sadly a few times, but at times in the Old Testament we see that happening. But this act of taking this nation into this other land was part of that bigger story. And also, we have to be really careful that we don't extrapolate from that an excuse today to say, well, we can just go and do the same willy-nilly and arbitrarily. We can't. Here's a third thing. What's happening here is not of human initiative, but divine. What do I mean by that? Often what we do when we think about God is what we do is we project our ideas of what humanity is like onto God. We kind of make God a kind of giant version of humanity. And so we therefore restrict God to the same kind of moral restrictions that we are faced by as human beings. Now listen carefully and don't misunderstand me. But listen, if God is the God who created us, not God being created by us, but if God created us, then he's not necessarily subject to the same moral restrictions that we are. Let me try and explain. It is wrong for me to kill you or anyone else. You'll be glad to know, and I agree. But it's wrong for me to kill you because your life doesn't belong to me. I would be taking something that doesn't belong to me. But if there is a God who created us and who gave me my life, and my life is a gift from him, then actually my life does belong to him. And if there is a God who created me in that way, then I would be therefore accountable to him. I think one of our problems is often we come to this question from the wrong start points. We come from the start points of assuming that basically we're all good people, innocent people who deserve God's blessing. And yet the really challenging thing that Jesus says is this. He says, actually, we're not good people, but guilty people that actually deserve his judgments. And that maybe changes the way we look at it. But it's not of human origin, but divine. Here's a fourth thing. It wasn't immediate, but God was patient. Um, Sometimes you get the impression that God just kind of like a impestuous um, person kind of loses his temper and just clicks his fingers and decides to wipe out a group of people for no reason. But actually what we read in the Bible is that God is incredibly patient, warning people over a period, actually we read of 400 years. Just look at this verse um, from the first book of the Bible in Genesis. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites. That's the same nation as the Canaanites, just a different different name for them. The sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So God is saying, actually, I am not going to just, you know, at the first sign of evil and sin, bring about judgment. But I'm patiently waiting and waiting and waiting and giving people an opportunity to repent, to turn back to me. 400 years which is a good deal longer, isn't it, than any just war has ever waited. It wasn't immediate, but it was patience. And here's the fifth thing. It wasn't inevitable, but it was avoidable. But what I mean by that is this. Um, God doesn't say, I'm going to judge these people, and because I've said it, it's going to happen whether they like it or not. But actually, there was a real opportunity for people not to face the judgment that they should have faced. In fact, we read about that in the story of the Exodus, in the very story of Joshua. We read about people from that land who actually recognized the God of Israel and repented from the kind of practices that they were involved in, 
and were spared the judgment that God had said was going to happen. And actually, a later story, the book of Jonah in the New Testament, um, tells us of another story where Jonah, a prophet from this nation of Israel, is sent to the Assyrians, an, another incredibly evil nation with evil practices at the time. And he sent to that nation to pronounce judgment. Now, it's a slightly um, interesting story because at first he doesn't want to go um, and do it. Unsurprising in some ways because... Um, you know, he was from their enemies and he was going to go and pronounce judgments. But he eventually does go, and the response of the people of this city of Nineveh was actually to repent, to turn from the way they were living, and to turn back to God. And actually, we also read that God doesn't judge them in the way that he said he was going to because of their response to the warning that was given. All the way through, there are warnings, but those warnings carry the very possibility that people could change. It wasn't inevitable. It was avoidable. But having said all of that, can I say, look, I don't find this easy. Um, you don't find reading the Old Testament easy. The God of the Old Testament is not a safe softy. The Old Testament includes blood and judgments. But actually, can I also say this? The New Testament does as well. Um, often the reason why people kind of separate the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is that they just haven't necessarily read much of either. And then when we look at the New Testament, we see that actually the judgment of the Old Testament is something that, though it doesn't happen now in the same way, God doesn't send a nation, whether it be America or Britain or anyone else, to exact this kind of judgment in space and time now. He does say these things are a prefigurement of a future judgment to come. We'll think more about that on Friday when we look at the idea of God's justice. That's a very sobering thing, although also I'd want to say, in a strange way, that's an encouraging thing. Because when I look at this world and when I watch the news on a daily basis, I really want God to bring about justice one day, because so often it doesn't happen now. But also let me say this, there is judgment in the New Testament, but there's also blood in the New Testament. But here's the incredible thing. The blood that we see shed in the New Testament is not the blood of God's enemies, but it's the blood of God's Son. The storyline of the Bible is of God stepping into space and time, not to kill his enemies, but to die at the hands of them, to shed his own blood, and we're told to face himself the judgments that they, that we, that I deserve in my place. A God who says that though I am not an innocent person who deserves God's blessing, but a guilty person that deserves his punishment, he is a God who's willing to take it on my behalf so that I don't have to. And therefore, as a Christian, I follow a God who forgave his enemies and died at the hands of them. That's why when Christians, in the name of Christianity and history, have tried to do things that are violent, I would say it's a complete contradiction of the Christ they claim to follow. But it's also a sobering reminder that actually if God's judgment is real, that what Jesus has done is really important. Now having said that, I'm aware that some of you might be saying, well, I don't even believe that this is true. Now remember what I said at the beginning. Um, there are two types of questions, moral objections and intellectual ones. Sure, on other days, in particular on Thursday night, we'll be looking at the kind of truth basis to how do we know the Christian faith is true. But can I say, as I said at the beginning, often our reason for not even investigating the truth claims of Christianity is because we've already decided we don't think it's very good. But actually, what I want to say is, though I don't find easy some of the parts of the Bible, I find there is a God who is good, good enough to not give me the judgment I deserve, but to take it himself. I love the Narnia books. I grew up on the Narnia books. Um, and uh, there's a bit in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first of the books to be written, where Lucy hears from the beavers about Aslan for the first time. And Aslan is this type, this picture of Christ, of God, um, that C.S. Lewis brings into his stories. And he hears, she hears that he's a lion. And Lucy says, well, is he, is he safe? And I think it was Mrs. Beaver said, safe? Who said anything about being safe? He's not safe, but he's good. Can I say, the God I find in the Bible is not a cuddly, safe God, 
But I do find, particularly as I see him most perfectly revealed in Jesus, he is someone that is utterly good and someone that I can trust. (laughs) 